Welcome to Candlewick Library. I'm Cheryl. Today I'm talking about how and why I left the Mormon Church. If this is the first video you're watching, you might want to go back and watch part one that I posted last week, where I shared how I became a Mormon and what my time as a Mormon was like. I do want to clarify a few things that I did forget about in the first video. I noticed afterward that I kept saying for the next 20 years, as if I had been Mormon for 20 years since my first temple experience when I married my husband. So I was 26 when Doug and I got married, and that was in 2003. So we have been married for 20, just over 20 years now, and the number would have been more accurate if I had said 17 to 18 more years of believing in those things after that. It doesn't really matter, but I just thought I would clarify that. Another thing I talked a lot about in that video was how I just never felt like I could ever do enough because I wasn't perfect at everything and because I didn't like everything that I always felt less than. Not just that I was, but that God looked at me that way. And I wanted to clarify something about that. I think a lot of people that have been Mormon and that are right now deal with extreme perfectionism, religious OCD or something like that. And it is definitely something that I dealt with and my oldest daughter at least dealt with. But I, I want to make clear that this is not just a me thing. Perfection is, is a huge deal in the Mormon church. And all you have to do to know that is look at some of the things that we do in church. The men in the church hold the priesthood, women do not. And so the ordinances are always led by men. And when you are 12 or over, then you are able to start doing those things. So in the sacrament meeting, when they do the sacrament, usually the teenage boys are the ones that say the prayers over the bread and water and the ones that pass it around. So they bring them around on little trays to everybody. But when the boys are saying the prayer over the water and then the prayer over the bread. It is exactly the same prayer every single time. And if they miss a single word, the bishop will make sure that they know that they have, and they have to keep saying it until they get it right. In every word I've ever been in, I don't know if this is enforced all the time or even now, they could not say those prayers or pass the sacrament if they're not wearing white shirts. Also, if when you get baptized, we baptize by immersion, and there's always a witness standing there to make sure that every part of you, every hair is under that water. And if it's not, you have to keep doing it until you get it right. So the perfectionism trickles into everything. It is not just a me thing to have felt like I had to be perfect. There is so much emphasis put on appearance and perfection in the LDS church, whether anyone wants to admit that or not. I also talked about prayer having a formula and so I thought I should clarify what I meant by that. Almost everybody says prayer is exactly the same way. We open up Heavenly Father. A lot of times people will say the exact same things in their prayer. There's usually something about we humbly ask you or something like that. And then every prayer ends exactly the same way. But also, if you give a talk in church, if you give a lesson, if you bear your testimony, if sometimes, if, even if it's a short message, I've seen church leaders do it online with, with uh, Instagram reels where they're just saying something really short and they're talking about something that is maybe an activity or something and they still end it the same way. Everything is always ended by saying, I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So there are so many formulas and so many rules to follow even in how you speak in the LDS church. And then I talked about my temple experience and how, how bad of an experience it was for me. I forgot to add in a few things, and that is that I said that I never enjoyed doing the sessions, but I didn't clarify why we keep doing sessions. I've covered this in some of my No Man Knows My History videos, but if you haven't watched those and you're coming to it right now and you're, you don't have a Mormon history, you might not know why we continue to go to the temple. That first time I went through the temple, when I had my really bad experience, I got my new name, and I was receiving those endowments, making those covenants for the first time. That was for me. After that, every time you go through, you are doing it for someone else. So you are doing it for your ancestor or somebody that you know, their ancestor, or you know some name that somebody has provided. So when you get the new name, that time it's for that person. And you are doing all of the motions, but it's called by proxy. So you're doing it for someone who is dead. This is one of the reasons, probably the main reason, if not the only reason, that genealogy is so important in Mormonism. A lot of people use the genealogy sites that have been created by the Mormon church. I think genealogy is fun. I think it is fun to know history and to know your personal history. 
But that is one of the main reasons that we put such an emphasis on it and do it is because that is how we find the people that still need their work done. Also, when I said that there was a part at, that we had to say at the Vell that was like a long paragraph and I had such a hard time remembering it, that was another thing that made me feel terrible about myself in the church all those years is because I never could remember it, ever. There was not one time that I went up and said the whole thing without help. And as somebody, as I got into my 30s, especially my late 30s and then my early 40s, that was pretty embarrassing. And I am actually not that bad at memorizing things. And so I never understood why I couldn't remember it. I have my theories now, but it was, it was so hard for me. I also, every time we had to stand up and change our robe over or do whatever, put on the clothes that we were putting on during the session, I was always so afraid of being the last person standing and having everyone in there sitting already and I'm still standing up trying to put my stuff on. And so I would rush through it like crazy, so anxious the whole time to make sure I wasn't the last person. I also thought completely seriously that I was the only person that had that experience in the session that I talked about in the last video, that I was the only person that felt that way. That stems from you know talking to other people and none of them reciprocating those feelings and feeling like I was the only one. And it wasn't until much later, which I'll talk about today, when I started hearing other people's stories that had left the church, that I found out how many people actually had the same feelings I did during the whole thing, and especially during that prayer circle when I had the thoughts of it being a cult came into my brain. I cannot tell you how many stories I have heard now where people have said those exact words at that exact moment. It has been so validating to hear that I'm not the only one. But for all of those years, I did think I was the only one. Also, in the last video, I did add notes that the all of the pictures that were inside the temple with church clothes, the ones that just showed the temple clothes and garments were from a church source. But the ones that had people wearing them, because I wanted to show kind of what they looked like on people, those were all stills from the Under the Banner of Heaven TV show. I did put that in the notes and on my video, but I wanted to just make sure that that was something people noticed. All the other pictures outside of temples and all that were my own. And then there was another part in the video that I put a note up but you might not have noticed it, but when I was talking about the hierarchy of the church, I said 12 apostles and then the prophet, and I forgot the two counselors that the prophet has. So the prophet has two counselors, and then there's the 12 apostles. So there are 15 men at the very, very top. Another thing I forgot to mention that I think is important to know, when people question how faithful I actually was, I talked about how I got the garments in that original session when I went through my endowment for myself. And what I didn't say was I hated wearing garments. The entire time, all of those years, up until the moment I took them off, I hated wearing them. Imagine wearing a t-shirt and like biker shorts made out of cotton under your clothes at all times. I didn't find it comfortable. I know there's some people that don't seem to mind it, but for me in the summers, it was just, I hated it. And yet I see people all the time right now. You can go on and watch any Mormon influencer and you will see them in their tank tops and short shorts on vacation or when they go to the gym. I never did that. I always wore clothes that I could wear over my garments no matter where I was. If I was on a vacation in a tropical place, if I was working out, I always wore them. The only time I didn't was, you know, showering and swimming. And so I feel like that's an important point because that is devotion. And in fact, my husband did once mention that he was appreciative of the fact that even when I had questions and that I didn't like them, that I still wore them. I bring that up because I'm gonna be talking about when I stopped wearing them today. I think it is very important to know that. Plus I do think, like I said, it shows that I wasn't just a wishy-washy Mormon. Two other things that I wanted to cover last week and forgot about were my children's baptisms. My oldest daughter's baptism was a pretty positive experience. My younger daughter, it was, but she was really scared and she didn't wanna get baptized. And we just thought it was just cause she was afraid of the water. And so she put on her big courage and got baptized and she still chose to do it. And you will notice that verbiage with all LDS people, we all say our kid chose to get baptized. We'll say it over and over and over again. And yet when they are eight years old and the entire primary program for eight years, eight year olds every year is it's great to be eight because we get to get baptized and all of their peers at church that are their age are getting baptized. And everyone in the family keeps asking, when are they getting baptized? Because they're about to turn eight or have turned eight. At eight, do you think that you would feel like you actually had a choice? Back then it made sense to me and I used that same term, but now I look back and I think none of them have a choice. Even if they think they do, it's not a choice. It's something that you do. And some are more excited about it than others. But just like everything else, when you feel like it is a requirement and you feel like it is expected by everyone you know, 
it doesn't feel like much of a choice. But our daughters were both baptized into the LDS church at eight years old. The last point is that in all these adult years, I always had faith. I always believed in the church so strongly and I was trying to do everything right. There were times that, like I said, that we didn't go to church as regularly as I felt like we should have. Partly was because I, I'll talk about it in a minute, but I had a health issue that made me really nervous about getting sick. People always go to church sick. So my kids, almost exclusively, when they got sick, it was from church. And so sometimes in the winter, we wouldn't go as much. Also, sometimes we would travel around and go to you know families, churches instead. Or when we'd go on vacation, we wouldn't always go to church. A couple of times we did. And so I always felt guilty about that. But there were the, the couple other things that always really bothered me. And I thought that I would preface what I'm about to say with the things that did bother me as a Mormon. I talked last week about learning about the Mormon murders. And so that had a seed in my mind that maybe they weren't as discerning as I thought they were, the leaders. And that I always had an issue with polygamy. However, I did not know the extent of polygamy. I didn't know how many wives Joseph Smith had. I didn't know he was marrying other men's wives. I didn't know he had married a 14 year old. The other thing that I had a problem with was the fact that so much was expected of me socially. And I would often say that the LDS church is a church for extroverts. It is very hard to be introverted and be a Mormon. Maybe not everybody will say that, but for me it was because we were expected to be social and get up and talk, get up and do lessons, have callings, do all of those things, but also their social activities and all of these things that are a lot harder for an introvert to do. And I have seen that a lot of extroverts really thrive in that environment. So that was something that was always hard for me. But the main thing that always bothered me. There were two things that really were kind of put on my shelf while I was an active Mormon. One was that it didn't make sense to me that God would tell Adam and Eve that they couldn't partake of the fruit, but that they had to gain the knowledge that they would gain from having the fruit of the tree in order to progress. That is LDS theology. So at the time, I did not know that it was only LDS theology. I thought that God was saying, I'm telling you to do one, this commandment, and in order to do that commandment, you have to do this other thing that I am telling you not to do. If that doesn't make sense right now, it will in a minute. But I thought that that was an across the board thing, and so that becomes very important in my journey. I also was never completely comfortable with the idea of, of us becoming gods. A lot of people will downplay that doctrine now, but it is doctrine. If you go to the celestial kingdom, if you go to the highest level, there's three levels of the celestial kingdom as well. If you go to that highest level, then you are exalted. So when you talk to Mormons about salvation and you as a non-Mormon say, well, you don't believe that we're saved by grace. Mormons will now say, yes, we do. And they really think they're telling you the truth because they believe that you can go to one of the bottom two kingdoms because of Jesus. The only ones that would not partake of the kingdom system and would be in hell, which Mormons call outer darkness, are what's called the sons of perdition. This is people like me, people like me that have been Mormon. If we've had all the ordinances and we give them up, we go to outer darkness. That's a really uncomfortable position for a lot of people that are active Mormons right now. They will say that's not true, but that is the doctrine. Someone like Hitler, who has had his work done in the Mormon temples, could be in the lowest kingdom if he accepts the Mormon church after he had his work done. But somebody like me, I would be in hell or outer darkness. In order to get ex exaltation, which is higher than salvation, you have to go the highest level of, the, of heaven and to do that, you have to have done the works of a Mormon. And if you do that, then you will then be able to create your own worlds and be gods. And again, there are people right now, probably in their 20s, maybe some in their 30s that are Mormon that do not think that that is top, but that is doctrine. But it is an uncomfortable doctrine, especially nowadays because people make fun of it. I was never completely comfortable with that. I also always felt weird about Heavenly Mother because in the Mormon doctrine, there is Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother who had a bunch of spirit babies. We are all brothers and sisters. That includes Jesus, Satan, and us. We are all siblings. And we had to come to earth from this pre-existence that we lived in with them. We had to come to earth to get a body and then try to become like God and eventually hopefully have our own planet and create our own children. So Heavenly Mother is doctrine, but she's not talked about. She, we, don't, we don't ever talk about her. And it's always said that we don't talk about her because she's sacred. And I always felt really weird when people would talk about her. And of course, back then I thought, oh, this is because she's so sacred. Now I know it's because she wasn't real and she was a false God and a false idol. It was something in me telling me that. 
I truly believe that. Also, it's good to note that since early church leaders made it very clear that God is a polygamist and that in order to become a God, you have to be a polygamist, then there would be more than one heavenly mother. And I don't think that most members think of that. And that is another reason they probably don't talk about her very often because then they would have to explain to people that they're would be more than one. Your heavenly mother is not my heavenly mother. I'm put, trying to put everything out here right now of who I was as a Mormon. I did have things that bothered me, and I think most Mormons do. There are definitely a lot of them that do not have a single question, a single problem with anything. They love everything about it. They believe in everything they've ever heard. They might, might not know everything, but they believe the things they know, and they are perfectly executing it. I was not one of those. So if you want to say that that means I didn't have enough faith, then you can but I really believed in everything that I did know. I just had a couple of questions about it or reasons that they didn't seem right to me, but I figured I had to believe in them. Now that that is out of the way, I'm gonna move on to share the story of how I came out of it. Most people that know me in real life that are LDS, I am certain they have no idea why I really left the church. And I know certain people that I know think certain things. This is partly because they know the things that I started talking about and asking questions about during over the last few years, and partly because the prophet of the church right now has called those of us that leave lazy learners, lax disciples. They talk about us following Satan. I saw a talk the other day given at BYU Idaho by a man saying that any of us who even talk bad about Joseph Smith are following Satan and we are being controlled by him. So most people watching this video that are faithful Mormons that don't want to believe in anything bad about the church and don't want to believe even the slightest bit that it's not true, they would look at somebody like me. In their minds, I would have only left because I'm a lazy learner, I'm being deceived by Satan, I want to sin, and those are not the reasons I left the church. I am not a lazy learner. I am, in fact, a voracious researcher. And while I did have some problems with some of the social and business side of the church issues, those are not the reasons I left. So I know that there are a lot of people that those are definitely the things that they are believing about me. And I wish that I could tell everyone all of the reasons I left. Unfortunately, most of my friends and family will not ever want to hear it. They won't let me talk to them about it. If I wanna keep those relationships, I have to be quiet. I am putting them on here for those people that it will help, people that are interested by this, and for anyone who knows me that actually might be interested in knowing the real reasons and maybe can, I don't know, learn how to treat people that have left or look at people that have left a little differently than you are taught even by your prophet right now. My story out of the LDS church starts in 2020. 2020 obviously was a very hard year for most of us. I think it shook out a lot of things. We had the riots going on here in the US. We had COVID and all over the world. We had neighborhood and home issues. There just seemed to be so much going on here in Utah, right at the beginning, we even had an earthquake one day and it just felt like the whole world was just folding down on us. And I think most people felt that way. I especially felt that way. About 10 years ago, I had a lot of heart palpitations and I was diagnosed with a thyroid disease called Graves disease. And so I was dealing with that for the years leading up to 2020. And when 2020 came and COVID started, I started having some more heart palpitations again and it made me need to go to the doctor. I did not have an endocrinologist at this point because the last one I had had wasn't very good. And so I was trying to figure out who to go to, trying to figure out how to navigate that during COVID. I was afraid that I was a high risk with COVID because of my disease. So now imagine that you believe that you have a prophet and apostles on this earth that speak for God and they tell you everything you need to know they see around corners and they shut down all the churches and they shut down the temples, even though temple work is essential to our exaltation and to our ancestors that have already died. Most churches I think closed for a little while, but they stayed closed. Every time I listened to my church leaders talking about COVID, I got more scared. I felt like the faith was out of the picture and it was exactly what I was hearing on the news I was hearing from my church leaders. And so I became extremely fearful. I would had anxiety issues with my thyroid disease and I'd always been more of a warrior as a mom. But besides that, I was pretty easygoing and I just became so anxious during this time. It broke me, it really did. I think a lot of people had that experience over 2020 but 2020 and 2021, I feel like it really broke me. But now I look back 
and I know that I was broken so God could build me back. So that is how the year started. I am going along, I'm fearful. We had to do church at home. I loved it. I loved being able to do church at home with my husband and my children and not have to worry about the callings and all of the other things. Even though it was sanctioned by our church leaders, that made me feel even more guilty because how could I love it so much? How could I not want to be going to the temple? How could I not be sad that we couldn't go to the church building? During this time, we ended up selling our house, which was a great thing because we really were unhappy in that neighborhood and in that house. And so we moved to a different town. In between, we lived with my parents for a few months, which was really, really good. It came at the exact right moment because we weren't getting to spend time with anybody. And to be able to spend time with my parents whom we're very close to, that was very helpful. And then we moved into our house at the end of 2020. I finally was able to get into a new thyroid doctor, an endocrinologist, in January of 2021. I also had another doctor visit going on at this time and they found some suspicious things that might have been cancer. Thankfully, that was ruled out. But on my first visit to the endocrinologist, he also said there were suspicious nodules on my thyroid and so I would have to do a biopsy. On January 28th of that year, I went in and did the biopsy. The lab results showed that I was finally in remission for Graves' disease, which was really great news. But then a couple of weeks later, on February 4th, I found out I had thyroid cancer. This was especially hard because this was the beginning of 2021 and we still had all of the COVID stuff happening. I had to go to all my doctor's appointments alone. I had to go to the biopsy alone. I had to go to the appointment where he gave me my results alone. And there really is something extremely hard about sitting with your doctor by yourself, finding out you have cancer. And at that point, not knowing what this meant for me, is this going to be a serious cancer or is this going to be something that can be fixed? He told me that he was pretty sure it hadn't spread and that I could get my thyroid out and I would be fine. And thankfully that is what happened. So on March 10th of 2021, I had the surgery to get out my thyroid. Thankfully, my husband was able to be there in the waiting room with me. We had to do lots of COVID tests and it wasn't very fun, but they were able to take out the whole thing. They were pretty sure that it hadn't spread. That has been the outcome. So I was able to get rid of the cancer from that surgery, thank goodness. So during this time, I found this group of women that did Bible study online and it was ran by a woman named Emily Bell Freeman. She called it the Inklings. And that is the reason I found it because I'm very interested in the Inklings of Oxford. And so when I saw the name the Inklings, I thought that was why it was called that. Uh, when my mom and I had gone to Oxford, we visited Inklings places. We went to the Eagle and the Child. And so I was pretty excited about that. Come to find out that is not why she chose the name. It has nothing to do with them. She was going through the general conference talks from the church leaders. Every week there'd be a new talk and she would lead a discussion on it that week. So I started doing that and I loved it. It was, it was really great. For somebody who like me who loves to go deeper into things and loves to really study, it was wonderful. And she also did something on YouTube called Don't Miss This with a man named David Butler. And in that, they were going through the Come Follow Me manual. So the Come Follow Me manual is a book that everybody gets at the beginning of the year. And it is whatever book of scripture that the whole church is studying. And so everybody is on the same study schedule every year. And they would do a lesson on YouTube about that week's reading. They kind of reminded me of especially David Butler, reminded me of that favorite seminary teacher that I talked about last week. And so I really enjoyed watching it and my family did as well. And since church was still closed, we, wa we started watching that every Sunday for our church. So I was doing Don't Miss This on Sundays and my own personal study and study with my daughters in homeschool and then also doing the inkling study on Thursdays. And it really was enriching my study. That year we were in, in 2021, we were in the Doctrine and Covenants, and I felt like it was really helping me to understand the Doctrine and Covenants. Of course, my study since then has told me, has taught me that a lot of that wasn't completely accurate, but at the time it was very helpful. I just went through that year doing my recovery, trying to get through all of it, still dealing with the world's problems. And at this point, the you know what that would go into people's arms was starting to come out. And from here on out, if I talk about it, I'm going to say you know what, just so that it doesn't affect my video. I can't explain it exactly, but I had a really bad feeling about it. And I knew that I shouldn't get it and that my daughters shouldn't get it. I didn't really want my husband to get it either, but he did. I talked to people around me, my family, and I, I was kind of telling everybody, let's research this more before everybody gets it. 
I just, I, I'm not feeling right about this, but everybody else got it. And thankfully there weren't any huge problems in my family as far as I know, but I did have a couple of friends that were. I had some that children got myocarditis. I had one friend that had a stroke and they, these were proven to be from the you know what. Doctors even admitted it. So I started to notice those things and I thought, okay, this is why I was feeling bad about it. So during the 2020 and into 2021 time, one of the other things that was really hard on me is that I felt like my church was becoming more liberal in the things that they were saying, the things that they were allowing, the things that they were talking about. I didn't understand it. I would sit and think, okay, we are told that the LGBTQ stuff isn't right, but then at women's conference, you're bringing out a woman that says she's queer and having her speak to everybody about using their pronouns and it just didn't make sense to me. I thought, well, which is it? Is it okay or is it not okay? I don't understand. Why are you riding this fence? And that's something they're still doing. They are becoming more and more liberal, but then they still pedal back and when they say things, say the opposite of what they do. And I was very confused and upset, wondering what was going on. Something I didn't talk about before is I always felt very underappreciated as a stay-at-home mom, and especially as a homeschooler. The ward that we were in, I was treated really badly by some people, even to the point where they would say things to my face or in front of me about how horrible homeschool was. A lot of people, when they talk about the LDS church, will talk about how women are oppressed and you're supposed to be a stay-at-home mom and all of that. And I do think that is most people's experience. However, I noticed that in my experience, people were treating me badly because I didn't have a career outside the home. I am trying so hard to believe in the things and act in the way that I was told I was supposed to as I was growing up as a teenager. And all of a sudden I feel like the rug is getting pulled out from under me. That the things that I've always believed were important and right aren't. So I'm dealing with that. I talked to some people in my family about that and a lot of people felt the same way as me and then some people didn't. In August of 2021, the leaders of the church, earlier they had all got the you know what. At this point in August, they put out a statement telling us that we should all get it. And they made sure to tell you it's still up to your personal revelation, your agency. But how much does that mean in a church where we are supposed to listen to everything they say? I cried all day the day that they put out that statement because I even had family members that were telling me, well, maybe you should get it now because they're saying this. During this time, two significant things happened. One was that I was really wanting to wear my cross necklace again. Ever since my surgery, I felt like I wanted a visual reminder and something I couldn't touch. So I talked to my husband about it and I said, I know that you asked me when we were dating to not wear cross necklaces, but I really want to. Are you gonna be okay with that? And he said, that's fine, wear your cross necklace. So I bought a cross necklace and started wearing it. I found that I was less anxious when I had it on because it was a great reminder to me to rely on Christ. Also at this time, an online friend posted a video from John MacArthur entitled, Providing Shade for Our Children, and said, this is a must watch for everybody. I had no idea who John MacArthur was. I hadn't watched any Christian pastors at all online. I wasn't following anybody like that. I didn't know anything about that world. And I decided to go on and watch this sermon. It ended up being four parts. They were almost an hour each. And he said everything about the world and social issues that I was dealing with that I wanted to hear. He was saying what I felt like was right. I asked myself, how is it that this man is saying everything that I feel like God is saying in his scriptures and that I've been taught is right and the LDS leaders are not. It doesn't make sense to me. A lot of you on here, you've probably seen me talk about him before on this channel. This is one of the reasons I really like John MacArthur. He was pivotal for me. I started watching him more and as I saw people around me getting hurt, I believe I had more discernment than the LDS church leaders did and that other non-Mormon leaders were standing up in the world for things that my leaders weren't willing to stand up for anymore. And it got me questioning them. So I wasn't questioning the church yet, but I was questioning the leaders of the church. During this time, I talked to my in-laws about this. I cried a lot. I cried more in the last couple of years than I have in my entire rest of my life combined. They sent me a, a talk called, that was the fundamentals of following the prophet. I know that they meant well, I know their hearts were in the right place, but it did hurt my feelings a bit. This was something I was getting from family. This was something I was getting online from friends as well. And this was something that you would start to see popping up anytime anyone talk talked negatively about anything that was going on. In the comments, people would be saying how we weren't following the prophet. Anyone in the church that wasn't, on the, that wasn't feeling the same way was using those words against us. You're not following the prophet. What I ended up doing that fall was I printed out every talk ever given by Russell M. Nelson, who is the prophet right now. And I read every talk he's ever given in general conference, even before he was prophet. And I found that he talked about the same things over and over again. 
And that was how I realized that he talked about the name of the church before he became a prophet. This wasn't a new thing. And I read the fundamentals of following the prophet. To me, it was garbage. It was so obviously propaganda to make us behave. So what this talk was, it was called the 14 Fundamentals of Following the Prophet. And this was a talk given at BYU by the prophet Ezra Taft Benson in February of 1980. And I'm actually gonna go through the 14 fundamentals that are in this talk so that you can understand why people were giving this to others because I was not the only one giving this talk during this time and what, why people go back to this talk over and over when they're trying to control or influence our behavior. It said that to follow the prophet, the 14 fundamentals were one, the prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord in everything. Number two, the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. The standard works is the word, is the term used for the scriptures. So the living prophet right now, that was Russell M. Nelson. Russell M. Nelson is more important, more vital to us than the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Mormon, and the Bible. Number three, the living prophet is more important than a dead prophet. This is an important point because then when the prophet right now says something, and it contradicts something that an earlier prophet said, then they can say, this is the living prophet speaking, so it's more important. And there was even a talk, I think it was in the last general conference, where a guy got up and talked about how the value of comic books increases over time, but that's not how it is with prophets. And so that if you bring up things from dead prophets, then people can also use that. Well, that was then, that was that time. Number four, the prophet will never lead the church astray. This is something people say all the time. He'll never lead us astray. But I would like to point back to the last point about dead prophets. So if somebody says, well, Joseph Smith said that people live on the moon, Brigham Young, said that Adam was God. Okay, well then they're not as important as the living prophet and he doesn't believe people live on the moon. But what about the people that were in the church at that time? Weren't they then led astray if those were incorrect things that those prophets were saying? So how can you trust your living prophet to not lead you astray if the past prophets were leading the people of their time astray? Number five, the prophet is not required to have any particular earthly training or credentials to speak on any subject matter or act on any matter at any time. So that may be something that a lot of people don't know about Mormons is that the leaders have not gone to a seminary school or something like that to train them in theology. A bishop of a ward is just somebody from the ward that gets the calling. Stake presidents, same thing. Patriarchs, the 70, the apostles, the prophet. They're all people that are just members of the church that have been given the calling. Number six, the prophet does not have to say, thus saith the Lord, to give us scripture. Again, then how do you know when he's speaking as a man or speaking as a prophet? So the only time that becomes a convenient argument is when you're trying to justify things that have been said in the past. Number seven, the prophet tells us what we need to know, not always what we want to know. Number eight, the prophet is not limited to men's reasoning. Number nine, the prophet can receive revelation on any matter, temporal or spiritual. Number 10, the prophet can be involved in civic matters. Number 11, the two groups, who have the greatest difficulty in following the prophet are the proud who are learned and the proud who are rich. So right there, they are setting all of us that don't follow the prophet up in other people's minds to be proud. In some way or another, we're just prideful. Number 12, the prophet will not necessarily be popular with the world or worldly. Number 13, the prophet and his two counselors make up the first presidency, which is the highest quorum in the church. And number 14, they ha he had to, of course, end with a warning. The prophet and the first presidency, the living prophet and the first presidency, follow them and be blessed. Reject them and suffer. That's ominous. I mean, if you fully believe in these people and you read that, are you going to risk it? The talk ended with a statement that if we want to know how well we stand with the Lord, then we had to ask ourselves how well we stand with his mortal captain, which is the prophet. I think you can see why that wasn't helpful to me in that moment and how it made me feel very guilty whenever anyone was talking about the things that concerned me and this was popping up everywhere. People sharing a link to this talk and people saying, you're not following the prophet. You're not following the prophet and you're not following the prophet because we're not doing certain things and we have a problem with certain things. Just follow the prophet, stop thinking. When the prophet speaks, the thinking has been done. That is an actual quote. You know, the indoctrination doesn't stop there. This follow the prophet idea doesn't stop at that talk. It is talked about all the time, especially now. Russell M. Nelson has brought in a whole new wave of prophet worship with him. It, 
You don't see it until you do, and then you can't stop seeing it. But the indoctrination of following the prophet starts young. We have a song called Follow the Prophet that is for primary kids. When they sing the song Follow the Prophet, they will say the phrase Follow the Prophet 54 times in that one song. None of that mattered. None of it made me feel good. None of it made me feel better about what I was going through. And I realized that I didn't really believe he was speaking for God at this time or that he could be fully trusted. And so that put me in a place that got me ready for the next step. During this time, I knew that we would be reading the Old Testament in Come Follow Me the next year. Emily Bell Freeman, who did the Inklings, who did Don't Miss This, she talked about different study guides that you could use. And she made me feel like I could step outside of the LDS Come Follow Me manual and my King James version of the Bible. And I could read something else. It was almost like she gave me permission, even though you know I didn't need that from anybody, but I felt like I did. She is now one of the top leaders over the women in the church. She is very respected. And so that can maybe help understand why I would feel that way. She recommended the ESV study Bible. So I have shown that this on here before. This is the one I purchased. It's torn up. I bought that because of her recommendation and decided to use that the next year in my studies of the Old Testament. I would also every year buy the journal edition of whatever book of scriptures we were reading and come follow me. So this is the Old Testament that I got at Deseret Book for 2022. I got all my little tabs in it. It's huge. I bought all of the things that Don't Miss This had, the little things you could put inside of it stickers and uh, I think they're called uh, tippins or something like that. I got myself ready to really study the Old Testament to help me in my understanding. I also got the Don't Miss This journal that they had created to go along with their YouTube show. This had a place for notes and journaling every single week and I would use it every week and I would write lots of notes in it and color in the pages. You can see towards about the middle, when I stopped doing that. But because of this journal, this is how I know a lot of the things that are about to happen when they happened, how I can remember it because I wrote a lot of things in this book. One thing I did do with the ESV study Bible is at the back, it talked about the LDS church being a cult. So I ripped that out and threw that in the garbage and said, okay, now I can use it. In December, Come Follow Me started, but we weren't just reading the Old Testament of the Bible. We were also reading the Pearl of Great Price with the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham. So I'm gonna read something from the church website about what Pearl of Great Price is in case you don't know. While translating the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery found that they had different views on the meaning of a passage in the Bible. They mutually agreed to settle the question by Urim and Thummim. As a result, Joseph received a revelation giving him the translation of an account by the ancient disciple John written on parchment but lost to history. About a year later, during the summer of 1830, Joseph and Oliver received a revelation of a visions experienced by Moses but not found in the Bible. This marked the beginning of Joseph Smith's efforts to prepare an inspired revision or translation of the Bible. For the next three years, Joseph worked on his new translation of the Bible with Oliver Cowdery, Sidney Rigdon, and other scribes. He did not employ Hebrew and Greek sources, lexicons, or a knowledge of biblical languages to render a new English text. He used a copy of the King James Bible as a starting point and dictated inspired changes and additions to scribe. He heavily revised Matthew 24, adding phrases, rearranging verses, and making other significant changes. So he did that with the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, which if you look at my big journal edition at the back, there is the Joseph Smith translation in that. So the book of Moses is revelation of visions that Moses had that weren't in the Bible. The book of Abraham, according to the church website, is a translation of ancient records from the catacombs of Egypt, writings of Abraham written by his own hand upon papyri. And people, when they want to argue the book of Abraham, they will actually sometimes say it wasn't on the papyri, but it states still on the church site at this point that it was. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go back to my No Man Knows My History video on the book of Abraham. But that is what the Pearl of Great Price is. So we're going to be reading that alongside the Old Testament. Also at this time, Emily Bell Freeman also, again, had recommended picking a word for the year. Not the pick a word that a lot of people do, where you pick a word that you want your year to encompass, but picking a word to study, something you want to learn about, and you look up every single scripture that in all the books that has that's about that. And I picked truth. And so I wrote that in my journal. On the week of December 27th through January 2nd, where we were reading Moses 1 and Abraham 3, I put in, I am looking for truth. That will be what 2022 was for me. I was looking for truth. The other note that I made at that point was that in Moses that week, it talked about how Moses saw God, but then it said he, only, he saw him with his spiritual eyes or he would have withered and died. And so I was like, well, wait, what about Joseph Smith? In the first vision, he saw God. Why does it tell us in the Bible and in the book of Moses that you will die if you see him? And so that 
gave me a little question to put on my shelf. That was the last week of December and going into this new part of study. 2022 begins. January 3rd through 9th, we were reading Genesis 1 through 2, Moses 2 through 3, and Abraham 4 through 5. And I wrote in there that I didn't like the Abraham account. And there was something really off to me about the use of the word gods. And I know that in the book, we'll say, and they, the gods, I know that it's referring to God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. However, they hardly ever use that language about all three of them and sounded like mythology to me. And I noticed that every time I was reading Abraham, not as much Moses, but Abraham, I felt yucky inside. That's the only way I can describe it. In my regular journal at this point, I had made a chart of worldliness and holiness and I had put the church right in the middle and underneath it I put I am probably sinning right now for even drawing this and that was not a joke that is how I was feeling and so that also shows that worry that I had about not being good enough especially even in my thoughts and in my own journal because of the way the book of Abraham was making me feel I decided to just look up the book of Abraham. I thought that I would feel better if I learned more about it. I googled the book of Abraham. The first thing that I saw was something called the CES letter. This was a letter I've talked about on different videos that a man named Jeremy Runnels put out and it was all of his questions about the church. I had never heard of it before and I didn't read the whole thing but I read the section on the book of Abraham. I all of a sudden was learning that the book of Abraham, that the papyri from it, that we have it and that Egypt, all Egyptologists, even the LDS ones have said, this is all in that video I made, that it has nothing to do with the book of Abraham. The facsimiles, the drawings that are in the book of Abraham have nothing to do with it. Everything he did, he translated incorrectly. And I was shocked by this and I didn't believe it. And so I immediately went onto the church website and looked up the book of Abraham and I found the gospel topics essay about the book of Abraham and found out it was true. Of course, they take a faithful approach to it. Well, maybe that's, maybe he thought he was translating the papyri, but he really was getting the revelation like he did Moses and he just, they, it was a catalyst for that. But to me that didn't make sense. And especially with the facsimiles referring to Abraham in the book and everything, it just, it just didn't make sense. I asked Doug about it. He was actually still in bed, he was still asleep. I get up pretty early to do my scripture study and I was sitting in our room, so I woke him up and I said, Doug, I, did you know this? And I started telling him about it. This was an important moment because he didn't believe me at first and I showed him the church gospel topics essay and it really shook him. And he had a few days where he really didn't talk much and he was just thinking about it. And then he finally came to me and said, okay, you know, I think I, I just have to fill in the gaps with faith. I have to just go by faith here. I, I can't think about this. I was really scared because I realized in that moment that he had never questioned anything and yet that one thing rocked him like that. So I realized, okay, I have these things I'm learning. I don't wanna to talk to anybody about it. I'm not gonna to talk to Doug about it. I'm not gonna to talk to my parents about it. I'm not gonna to talk to my kids about it. I don't want to affect anyone else's faith while I'm trying to figure out these questions I have. And so for the next few months, I would study completely in secret about all of these things I was finding out. In the January 10th to 16th week, it was Genesis three through four and Moses four through five. And in Moses 5.11 makes it very clear that Adam and Eve couldn't have children unless they left the Garden of Eden. And so this is from the Come Follow Me manual for that week. At first, the story of the fall of Adam and Eve might seem like a tragedy, but because of the truths restored through prophet Joseph Smith in the book of Moses, we know that the story of Adam and Eve is actually one of hope and an essential part of God's plan for his children. The Garden of Eden was beautiful, but Adam and Eve needed more than beautiful surroundings. They needed, and we all need, an opportunity to grow. Leaving the Garden of Eden was the necessary first step toward returning to God and eventually being becoming like Him. And you'll notice in the Come Follow Me manual, they ask questions that you're supposed to ask your kids and stuff, and it never would say, was it necessary for them to leave the Garden of Eden? It would say, why was it necessary? They ask you the questions, you know what answers they're looking for. And that was the view I'd always had that I talked about earlier that I always was confused about. Because of the fact that I had really become interested in John MacArthur, I had picked up his book, 12 Extraordinary Women. And I was reading the chapter on Eve at this point. When he was talking about the timeline and saying that, that Satan must not have been fallen yet when creation was done because creation was very good. And so it had to have been some time after that, that that happened. And he said it couldn't have been very long because Adam and Eve had not yet even conceived any children. And I stopped and was like, wait, what? What do you mean they didn't have any children yet? They couldn't have children yet. During this whole year, I told you I got the ESV study Bible. What I was doing every day was when it wasn't the Pearl of Great Price, when it was the actual Old Testament we were reading, 
I would read it in my King James version that has all my LDS footnotes and all of that. And then I would read it in the ESV and then I would read their study notes. So I went back to the ESV and I read it again and I realized that wasn't there. I realized for the first time that the thing that never made sense to me because why would God tell them, you need to have children, and that is a commandment, but don't eat of this tree. But you can't have children unless you eat of this tree. That makes no sense. Us fallen humans wouldn't do that to our children. Why would God, who's perfect? It doesn't make sense at all. And all of a sudden, I realize the Bible story makes sense. It's the Mormon theology added to it that doesn't. I sat in my chair. This At this point, I was out in my family room on the couch reading. It really felt like in my head, a curtain opened up and all of a sudden I could see the truth. It was a huge pivotal moment for me. I shared it with a couple of people, one of whom told me that's not true, I don't believe that, that, which made me kind of clam up again. But I felt so much peace about this. That week on the Sunday, my daughter, my oldest daughter got her patriarchal blessing. And a patriarchal blessing is a special blessing. You go to a man that has the calling of a patriarch and he gives you a blessing that's kind of like a horoscope. It basically tells you what lineage of the 12 tribes you come through and promises that God is making to you in your life if you live up to your covenants with him. If you do everything you're supposed to, you're gonna get X, Y, Z. Obviously, sometimes these blessings are backfire because somebody is told that they'll have lots of children and then they can't have children. And there's always an answer for that if people question it. I was really worried the last 10 years because mine had talked about how I would always have a strong body. And so since I had had been very healthy most of my life until I got the thyroid disease and then cancer, I didn't understand that. I, I, it made me question again, what am I not living up to because I'm not having that, that strong body that I was promised. Church in our ward had just started meeting again in person. The young men and young women activities had started up in person again, but we had personally decided to wait for a few months to go back again. One, because of it being right in the middle of winter, and second, just because of the feelings I was having, I really wasn't in a hurry to go back. And my daughters, neither one of my daughters were really interested at all in the young women activities. We had talked to the bishop about her getting it. He questioned her worthiness to get her patriarchal blessing. And I said, you have no idea. This is the most faithful girl I know. She fasts for everybody whenever they're have, going through anything or doing anything. She reads the scriptures without having to be told by herself every day. She is so concerned about doing the right thing all the time. And you're saying that you don't think she's worthy of getting her patriarchal blessing because she hasn't come to young women. And I was really upset about that. And so finally he relented and, and said, okay, you know, yeah, she can, she can get it. And my daughter had her patriarchal blessing. It was supposed to be a very special occasion. For her it was. She, she was very concerned about filling the things that she was supposed to fill and listening intently because it was such, it, this was God speaking directly to her. But I got a really horrible dark feeling during her patriarchal blessing. And I didn't say anything because I was worried. I was like, is that because this is wrong? Or was that because I'm in the wrong place and I'm questioning things? And so I'm getting this dark feeling. So then the next thing came in the February 7th to 13th week when we were reading Gen Genesis 12 through 17th and Abraham 1 through 2. Sorry, I keep reading my notes, but I just want to remember what chapters were each week. And at that part, it's talking about how Abram went into the handmaiden to have children. And I realized just because of my of my ESV study Bible, that polygamy wasn't sanctioned in the Bible. Because in the book of Abraham, it is. It's God telling him that he needs to go to the handmaiden. God is the one that tells him to lie. And all the different things that Abraham does really wrong are God telling him to. And all of a sudden I realized that that wasn't the Bible story either. And so I wrote in my journal that day, I like the Abraham story a lot more if I only go with the original Genesis version and not adding the book of Abraham or the Joseph Smith translation. Then I put a little note that week, I don't think I believe in the book of Abraham. And that makes things complicated. So all of a sudden I'm realizing there is a book of scripture in my church and I don't believe in it. And a lot of doctrine comes from this. What does that mean? I also started watching things from Answers in Genesis. And I decided I wanted to take a trip to Kentucky to see the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. I began planning for this trip. Doug wasn't gonna be able to go, so my mom decided that she wanted to go with us. In March, when we were reading Je the end of Genesis, I noticed that the Joseph Smith translation added on extra verses to the end of Genesis, and in that is a, is a prophecy of Joseph Smith himself. I had always thought that it was amazing that the Bible prophesied of Joseph Smith because I didn't realize that that was added by him later. So I wrote in my journal, why are there extra verses in Genesis? And it's kind of fishy that they are about Joseph Smith. Over the next couple of months, 
as we studied the Bible, there were some verses that started really sticking out to me. Because like I said, at this point, I'm questioning my leaders, but now I'm starting to question our scriptures as well. So the first one is in Numbers, in Numbers 23, 19, where it starts, God is not a man. And of course, in LDS theology, like I said, we talk about we become gods ourselves, but that also is with the teaching that God was a man once. So our God was a man who became an exalted being and became God. This is telling me in the Bible that God is not a man. And then in Deuteronomy 13, it's talking about the test of false prophets. And I had written in here, miraculous signs alone were never meant to be a test of faith. Think Pharaoh's magicians. If his message contradicts God's words, he's not a prophet no matter what miraculous things he's done. And that helped me as I started to think about, well, wait, what about all these blessings that have come true in the church? What about when somebody gives a blessing of healing and it works? How, how is this possible if it's not true? I delved in a little bit deeper into it that a prophet makes a prophecy and it doesn't come true ever, even once, then they're not a prophet. And I knew, and I knew that Joseph Smith had lots of prophecies that didn't come true. And so I started to question whether he was really a prophet or not. At this point, there was general conference and all the leaders spoke and I watched it and there were some things I wrote in my journal, there were some things that said that I needed to hear. So that kind of pushed down my feelings again. Of, okay, I'm starting to have all these doubts, uh, doubt your doubts. But those verses in the scripture just kept coming back to me as well. So when May came, we went on that trip that I had been planning to Kentucky. We stopped at some literary places along the way and then we went to the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum, which cemented to me my views on creation. And I loved it. I loved the Ark. I loved the Creation Museum so much. My oldest daughter was a little cranky. I didn't really understand why. Now I do and I'll get to that in a minute. When we left, we made sure to stop at some LDS church sites on our way home because I felt like it was very important for me to go to them. One was Adam on Diamond, where they believe the Garden of Eden was. One was Far West and one was Winter Quarters. And these are all places I've talked about in my No Man Knows My History during the, the early church history of the LDS Church. At each of these places, I prayed. I prayed and prayed and prayed, God, I don't care what I think. I don't care what I think from any of the stuff I've been studying. I don't care what anyone says. All I want is truth. That's what I've been searching for this whole year so far. All I care about is truth. Please tell me if the LDS Church is true. And if it is, and God really cares about me and wants me to follow the right path, I should get a sign, right? Like the whole idea of the Book of Mormon is that you read it and then you pray at the end with sincere heart and God will let you know or the burning in your bosom or whatever, that, that it's true. And so I knew that God could answer me of whether this church was true. And as I stood in Far West, where the temple law is, as I stood in Adam and Ayaman, where it's supposed to be the Garden of Eden, that should be a sacred place. I felt nothing. I felt completely empty. And I thought to myself, I felt God more at the Creation Museum than I am here. That really shook me up even more. A few days later, we got home and my husband had gotten sick while we were gone, so I slept out on the couch. My mind was just racing. My mind was going through all of these things that had come up over the last couple of months, that had come up over the last couple of years, and I decided to just go on the church website and read everything. And I had known about the Gospel Topics essay about Book of Abraham, so I went back on and I read it again. I saw that there were other ones. So I read all of the Gospel Topics essays. Some of the things I didn't understand because I hadn't heard of the problems that they addressed yet. So these essays are very widely believed to be an answer to the CES letter, that when that came out, it was getting so much traction that they really were forced to try to get their viewpoint out about these things and make it look like they weren't hiding anything. And then I read all of the gospel topics, which were just little snippets about different things. Those are not on there anymore. I read through the handbook. I read some articles that popped up. And I stayed up almost the entire night reading all of this and finding out things that I had never known about church history, just from the church website. Most people don't even know that these things are there and they won't, they don't go and read them. After I was finished doing that and I realized how much I didn't know about the church, there were a few other issues that I was not okay with the way that they handled them on the website. I really was curious, what else don't I know? I remembered the CES letter and I went back and I printed it out and read the whole thing. That is when, all the bricks started falling down around me. I went back to the church's website and the essays to fact check everything. And I suddenly realized what they were saying in the essays that I had glossed over before and I hadn't understood. While there are a few things in it that I didn't agree with or a few things didn't check out completely, most of it was completely accurate. The things that were, were horrible. That next day I talked to Doug and I told him I really wasn't sure that any of this was true. And I took off my garments. That was terrifying. And 
Any of you that have never been Mormon, I don't think you can understand how scary it is to stop wearing your garments because we are taught that they are a protection. It's just like tithing. You're, they refer to tithing as fire insurance. So you believe that these things that you have to do are actually physically important, not just spiritually important. And so there was a part of me that questioned, is something really bad gonna happen to me now? And I had that fear on me for quite a while. Thankfully, it went away eventually when I realized life was going on as normal, but I was really scared for a long time about that. I started looking for other stories. I wanted to hear from other people that, that were going through the same thing I was, that had the same feelings I did. And I went on YouTube and I was just looking for things randomly and I didn't even know these things existed, but I found Mormon stories. It's a, a YouTube channel with a man named John Dalen and he interviews people. Sometimes they talk about church history with specialized people and sometimes it's just people he has on that he talks to about their, their Mormon stories. Very similar to what I'm doing right now, but these are very long form. They can be anywhere from three to five or even longer hours sometimes. And I started watching them, even though a lot of them had different issues and different reasons they left the church and not all of them ended up as Christians, there were still similarities in almost every story. And I found Mormonism Live with Bill Rill and Radio Free Mormon, and they were talking about church things. And I started watching all of these and realizing for the first time, I am not alone. Other people were freaked out by the temple ceremonies. Other people have delved into church history and found things. Other people have left the church that are not lazy learners, or even if they left for completely different reasons than I did, they didn't leave just because they wanted to sin. Realizing that the narrative around those of us that leave is completely wrong most of the time. It was such a good experience to be able to hear other people's stories. It's another reason I feel like it's important to share mine. A couple of weeks after that, John MacArthur had a Truth Matters conference and that got my attention because of the fact that I was using, using the word truth that year and trying to find truth and it was called Truth Matters. And it took place at the ARC because he couldn't do it in California at that point because of some of the COVID rules, but it was streamed online and I was able to watch it and hear from him, but also uh, quite a few other pastors and different Christians. I realized after watching that for three days that it was a completely different approach to the gospel of Christ that General Conference had been a month before. And I got so much more out of it and I learned from it. I wasn't just being told platitudes that I've been told a million times. I wasn't just being told things that would make me feel good or make me believe in what I already was taught or make me feel bad about the things I was questioning. I was actually being taught about the Bible and about God. It stuck out so much because it was so different. And then a few days later, my daughters and I went to uh, our first homeschool convention that they went to with me here in Utah, and it was an LDS themed one. And I had bought the tickets very early, and so I decided to still go. My daughters at this point had no idea the questions I was having and all that. So we went to this homeschool convention for three days and we hated it. My kids came away from it feeling like they wasted three days. So that was an interesting experience. My oldest daughter was also supposed to go to something called FSY for the strength of youth and it's put on by the church and it was gonna be at BYU and it was where she would go to classes and meet other kids and have a roommate and go to a dance and all those different things. And that was supposed to happen right after this conference. But then someone shared online that teenagers that were transgender were going to be allowed to go and might be your kid's roommate. And I didn't really believe that right at first, but I called the person in my ward that was in charge of it. And I said, hey, is there a chance that my daughter would ha will have a roommate that is a biological boy? She said, oh, I have no idea. Um, you'll have to talk to the stake person about that. So I texted the stake person and I said, is there a chance that my daughter will have a biological boy as a roommate? And she was really snarky about it. I don't think she liked my question. And she was like, I don't know, you'll have to call the hotline. So I called the hotline, the church hotline for FSY and asked a missionary or whoever was volunteering there. And they said, that's a really good question, I don't know. And so a few days later, I called back again, I got a new person and they said, I don't know, but I'll talk to my supervisor. So they had me on hold for a while and the supervisor came back and said, well, yes, there is a chance that a transgender girl would be your daughter's roommate. But if she has a problem with that, then she can always go to her counselor and tell them and then they'll switch rooms. And I thought, are you serious? You're expecting my shy daughter go to the counselor and probably make everybody hate her, make somebody feel bad. Why aren't you protecting my daughter? Do you know how many things could go wrong in that situation? Okay, if you're gonna let transgender kids come to this, shouldn't there be special accommodations? Shouldn't there be something set up in place so that this kind of thing doesn't happen? And I talked to my daughter about it and 
we both felt very much like they were protecting trans kids over my daughter. Didn't take seriously that that could be a danger to her or something that would make her uncomfortable. And so we decided not to have her go there. I had written a letter to the prophet at the beginning of this year saying, I feel like you don't care about conservative members. You don't care about those of us that, you know, have certain viewpoints or are stay at home moms. You're parading around the influencers all the time and you're, you know, doing all these things for show. What about us? Is there a place in this church for members like me? And I had not heard a response. This incident made me feel even more that way. And I was really glad I wrote the letter, even though I didn't get a response. Around the same time, I'd heard about this book and I don't know how I even heard about it. I don't remember, but Passport to Heaven by Michael Wilder. I got this book from Amazon and I started reading it. I read it over the course of just a couple of days. In this book, he is a Mormon missionary and he goes to Florida and a Baptist preacher challenges him to read the Bible, especially the New Testament, I think, uh, with new eyes. So he does. Micah goes into it and at first, of course, he's offended and, you know, how dare you, you know, say what I'm, say these things about me, but he reads it. And at this one part, he said, as my eyes scanned the pages, the culmination of years of seeking satisfaction through my religion rose to the surface and I began to shed tears. Jesus had boldly pronounced, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. How could that be? How could he alone satisfy in such a way? Could the answer to filling the void that plagued my life be Jesus alone? It all seemed so simple, too simple. I instinctively knew there was a far deeper level to this love and I yearned for what Jesus was offering. I hungered for the bread that would fill my soul and satisfy me eternally, but I didn't know how to partake of it or even where to find it. I had spent my entire religious life trying to satiate the famine in my soul, but I still felt hungry. All I knew was that every time I read the Bible, something awakened within me. This book affected me so much because he talked about how when he was a child, he was so close to God, but then when his family converted, when they moved to Utah, that that went away and he was chasing that feeling up until this point. And that is exactly how I think I described my experience last week. I was always chasing that feeling and trying to be good enough to feel close to God again all the time. On June 7th, my daughter wrote me a letter and she set it in on my chair for me. It was a pretty long letter. She said in it, I don't wanna talk about this, but I need to tell you how I'm feeling. And in it, she talked about how at the Ark, the reason she'd been cranky was because she saw a book about Mormons and it was very obvious from the title and the description of the book that it was that Mormons weren't part of Christianity. She was really stressed out about that. And she started to notice differences in me over the few months of how I talked about the prophets, how I talked about church. And so while I thought that I was hiding this really well and that nobody knew what I was going through, my daughter was picking up on it. And so she was sharing with me how worried she was about where I was with church, the church and what my thoughts were. And I knew that I couldn't just brush her off. So I brought her in and I said, I'm sorry, I know that you said you didn't want to talk about this, but we have to. And I told her the things that I had found out. I hadn't told her everything yet because I didn't know everything yet, but I told her the things that I had found out, why I was feeling the way I was. She was really quiet and she said, okay, you know, and we kind of moved on. And I said, I will let you know you know, if I, if, if I have any other concerns and you tell, talk to me if you have any. And then my younger daughter wanted to talk about it. So I told her what was going on and how I was having doubts about this church. And this was another very pivotal moment because this was when I learned that my youngest daughter, she really at this point still doesn't feel like she's called to marriage and children. She told me through tears in her eyes that she always had felt like she was going to be separated from the rest of us because we would all be in the celestial kingdom and she wouldn't be able to be there because she wasn't going to get married. And so she felt she was going through the motions and acting as if she was okay with everything and believed in everything, but she felt less than everybody else and that she was going to be separate and alone for all of eternity while we got to be together. It was heartbreaking to me to find out that she'd been dealing with this. As I sat and looked at my daughters and thought about it and I realized how stressed my oldest daughter would get when she was fasting. If like, oh, did I do it long enough? You know, did I pray the right way? Am I doing the right thing? And I just realized how much stress my daughters had on them. And all of those things I've been feeling about myself for years, that they were feeling them too. And they didn't really understand God's love for them. It broke my heart. And it made me feel really bad that I had brought them up in a way that was putting so much stress on them religiously. When I just finished reading this Passport to Heaven book where he talks so much about God's love in the New Testament. That week, I wrote in my journal, so much is missing from the Come Follow Me readings. They are skipping so much because they would, they, they didn't actually read the whole Old Testament or the whole New Testament in the year that they did that. 
it's basically certain chapters so that they can get through it in the year without I guess overdoing it. I think that some of them are strategic, but a lot is left out. So I've written that. And then I wrote, I am walking away from the church, but not completely. It looks different to me now. It feels like a very shallow religion functioning for show. I'm still holding on to the Book of Mormon and the priesthood, but I don't believe in the Joseph Smith translation or the Pearl of Great Price or the Doctrine and Covenants. Just a week later, when we were in First Kings, I prayed that morning to know what to do. I would imagine that a lot of you watching this are thinking, what is there to still question? Why don't you just walk away? You know that some of these things aren't true you're, you're having all these experiences and this is what I mean by most of us don't leave easily we don't just make a spur of the moment decision to leave the church the way people think we do I was still really struggling and I really still wasn't sure about the priesthood because I had felt like it had worked a few times in my life and I'd heard other people so many stories that it had the Book of Mormon I I'd, I'd never had that end of the Book of Mormon oh this is amazing I know it's true experience that everybody else had I just felt peaceful but in the church we're taught that peaceful feeling is a you know is the spirit confirming something in us there were so many things I liked about it and so I just wasn't sure still and that morning I was praying to know God, I really just need to know the truth. I, I'm going back and forth on this so much and I need to know the truth. And I opened up 1 Kings and I was reading and I came to chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? And I'm not sure if I've ever felt so seen as I did in that moment. I, I didn't know for sure what the answer was yet, but I felt like I did know because the Bible was telling me how long are you gonna be here between these two opinions? When are you gonna make this decision? And I knew that I couldn't stay in that spot forever. And that was when I picked up No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody. And obviously I have lots of videos about this book, breaking it down, but this is where I learned a lot of the things I did not know yet. A lot of the things about the Book of Mormon, how it was translated, how, how he was a treasure digger, how he, his family was into folk magic, how the tree of life story in the Book of Mormon is almost identical to a vision his own father had. So much of it is right straight from the Bible. And in fact, some of it is word for word from the Bible, but then his Joseph Smith translation has different words for that same part. There's parts that were added in by the King James translators, and he still has them in the Book of Mormon. And so that started to really break apart the Book of Mormon for me as well. And I wrote in my journal, July 26th, that I just finished Esther this morning, and I will not be continuing with the LDS Church. I was still listening to a lot of people's stories, but I also really wanted to read more people's stories. And so I also found this book, Out of Zion, by Lisa Brockman. It was recommended on Amazon because of reading The Passport to Heaven. And when I opened this up, I didn't love everything about this book as much as Micah's because her whole story didn't resonate with me as much as his did. But she talked about how the attributes we assign to God do matter. Just as it wasn't possible for those Lisas to be a same person, I saw that a God of flesh and bones who is a created being is not the same as the Trinitarian God who is uncreated and spirit. A God married to a heavenly mother who begot every person on this earth in a pre-existing world is not the same God who is an eternal community of love with his only begotten son and the Holy Spirit. I could not ignore the reality that the Mormon God and the God of the Bible are different. How could I know which one is real? Could I trust the Bible? Could I trust the Mormon doctrinal books? These questions lingered in the back of my mind. I had been taught that the Bible was fallible. So she's looking through this and seeing all of the different things in the Book of Mormon that are contradicting with the Bible. And of course that had been my experience so far this year. And so that really stuck out to me. And then she wrote, it seemed like layers of scales were being peeled off my eyes one at a time like peeling an onion. Bits of light shone where there had previously been only confusion, illuminating my mind and my heart to see what I hadn't seen before. The first layer that was peeled back enabled me to see that the Bible is God's word. That is how I felt. When I read that, I said, yes, that is the truth. The Bible is God's word. If any of this other stuff does not match up with it, I am throwing it out. I'm done. And then she went into salvation and she started talking about the Mormon view of salvation and the Christian view of salvation. She was talking to a friend who was also considering leaving the church. They went into Genesis and went to when Adam and Eve were, when they were tempted by the serpent. The serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as it gods, knowing good and evil. I had a note in here from one of my answers in Genesis studies that the devil's first words were a question. Did God actually say? The first thing he did was question God's word. And when she was talking to this friend, she asked about that. What happened in the Eden? And her friend said they wanted to become like God. So they threw out living in the mysteries of his love and embraced a false vision of him. She said to her friend, 
Now think about the end goal of the Mormon plan of salvation. And her friend said to become like God. And she said, isn't it interesting that the entire goal of Mormonism is to exalt into godhood, which was the original sin. And I knew in that moment that the LDS church was not true. Everything I'd been questioning, everything I'd been learning, it all came to that one moment. Joseph Smith was not a prophet. Therefore, the Book of Mormon is not the word of God. All of these other scriptures were not the word of God. All of this theology that contradicts the Bible is not real doctrine of God. It's not the real gospel of Jesus Christ. I knew, I knew it wasn't true. I finally felt secure telling Doug and my daughters about everything that I had been learning and what I now knew to be true. At first, Doug didn't believe some of the polygamy stories I was telling him. For example, the one where Emma finally had given Joseph permission to marry the two sisters that were living in her house and he was already secretly married to both of those sisters and they had the sham wedding so that she wouldn't know that he had already been married to them. When I told him that story, he didn't believe it, but all I had to do was pull out the saints book and they actually had the story in that. And so I was able to take church sources and show him the bare bones of the stories I was learning and then tell him the rest of the story. My youngest daughter and I began visiting Christian churches and we did find one that we liked a lot. And now that the Book of Mormon was gone, the only thing that I even had an inkling left in my mind about was the priesthood. And that was what they spoke about the first day. We were in Hebrews and they were talking about why the priesthood wasn't around anymore. As somebody who's been trained as a Mormon, you pick up on when things like that happen. My further study of the Bible opened up my eyes even more, but I'd already didn't believe it was true, but it's funny because even after that, occasionally I would stop and go, what if I'm wrong? Oh my gosh, what if I'm wrong? If I'm wrong, I'm messing with my children and my husband's life. My husband has stopped wearing his garments now. We've stopped paying tithing. What happens to them if I'm wrong? and if I'm telling them wrong information. And every time I thought that, God would give me a new bit of information. In Isaiah 43, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. In Matthew 2, it talked about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and how they were united in opposing Christ. And it talked about all of the different things about them and how the Pharisees were ritualists and legalists and they did everything for show and they wanted the best seats so everybody could see them. And I realized the LDS church leaders they resembled the Pharisees and the Sadducees even more than they did the apostles who they say they're emulating. In Matthew 16, where Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, what does that say then about a great apostasy and all this information being lost after that? That would make Jesus a liar. In Matthew 24, there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. My studies told me that Jesus would not come secretly to a select group and stay hidden from public view. He would come like lightning, sudden and visible to all. And LDS teaching is that Jesus would come to Adam and Diamond first, with the leaders and the priesthood holders. Matthew 27, 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And I had a quote from John MacArthur that said, the veil was ripped top to bottom, the way that had barred the people, no more barriers, priesthood, holy of holies, temple, sacrifices. The way to God was thrown wide open by the sacrifice of Christ. John 4, 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Acts 17, 24, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. In 2 Corinthians, 11 it warned against false apostles and it said no marvel for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of christ and no marvel for satan himself is transformed into an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as those ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their work which of course makes you think of the visions of joseph smith saying that angels of light came to him. In Galatians 1, 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. If any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. In Colossians 2, it talks about the false teachers claimed access to the mysteries of God's truth. But Paul insists that Christ is God's mystery and all understanding is to be found in him. In Revelation 21, verse 22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So why are we building all these temples if they're not needed when Christ comes again? And I was forced to really look at salvation and grace and what is the Bible telling me about it? Well, in Acts 2, verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans 4, Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And my ESV study guide said that if salvation were based on works, then God in granting a person salvation 
would merely be repaying what he owed that person. And Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All of these are from my King James Version Bible, and this I actually bought halfway through that year because I wanted to be able to read without the distraction of the LDS footnotes. When I was forced to look at grace this way, I realized all this temple work that we're doing in the temples, we call them saving ordinances. And if my ancestors have to have me to go and get baptized for them, go and get anointing for them, go and do a temple session, get their endowments for them, do ceilings by proxy for them. If we have to do all of those things to save them, then what was Christ for? Am I putting myself on the same playing field as Jesus Christ? That if I don't go and do those things, then what he did means nothing to them? And there's no way to stand up against that. I knew that they're keeping us going to the temple over and over again to keep us busy, to keep us believing that that is what we need to do. If they can keep us going to the temple, then they can keep us paying the, our tithing because you have to pay your tithing to go to the temple. Like I said, every time I doubted, one of those verses was found or something else. I read something or watched something and God let me see the truth over and over and over again every time I doubted again. In Romans 10, it says, They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And I made a note in here that this was me before I learned the truth. Because I always had a zeal for God. And I always had a zeal for what I believed the truth was. But I was ignorant of the things that I didn't know about my own religion. I was ignorant of how much it contradicted the Bible. And people will say, oh, well, yeah, sure, it contradicts the Bible, but the Bible contradicts itself. But I have studied that, and I have found that, that the so-called contradictions in the Bible really aren't. This was just all very important to me. I had some really, really hard things happen that year with family members and friends. I still am having it happen. I'm still losing people in my life. And I've had some hard things where people feel like we need to be quiet. I, I've talked about that, I think, in the last video. They want us to be quiet. We're supposed to leave the church and never talk about it negatively. In Acts 4, it says, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. And I wrote next to this from my... ESV study Bible, the leaders were motivated by fear of losing power and influence rather than by a desire to glorify God, to be faithful to his word or to spread the knowledge of salvation. And then I wrote underneath that, when you know, you must speak the truth. And that is how I feel. I left the church because sure, social issues. Sure, I was upset about the you know what. Yes, I stopped believing in the prophet and his apostles as being men actually called by God and telling us what God wants us to know. I know they're not. They've been wrong about so many things. And the prophet right now, he has said stories that are lies. And you can go and you can actually find the proof of the fact that he has lied about stories he's told at General Conference multiple times. Other apostles, same thing. Just this last year, they got in trouble for creating shell companies over the last 20 years so that they could hide how much money they had from the general public and the members. And this was, I mean, it's basic tax fraud and they were fined for it. But when asked about it, a church, a high up church leader that was involved even said that they didn't want the members to know how much money they had because they might stop paying tithing. They have repeatedly protected abusers over their victims. They're not men of God. Yes, I was upset about how much of the church history had been hidden from me and to find out what Joseph Smith really was like. But that isn't why I left. I left because God showed me over the course of an entire year the truth over and over and over again in a year when that's all I was seeking. And he showed me it in his word. The Bible and God are the reason I left. So in January of 2023, my daughters and I all requested to get our names taken off the LDS church record. I was kind of going back and forth on whether I cared enough to get my name off of the records. But in December, right around Christmas time, both of my daughters made it very clear that they wanted their names taken off the records. And so that was, I think, all I needed to put into action what I was feeling like I wanted to do as well. I had to email the bishop and let him know. He emailed me back, told me how disappointed he was, told me he needed to speak to me in person, but we could do it over the phone. He went through all of the questions and statements that he's required to do from the handbook and made sure that I knew that this meant that all of my previous blessings were taken away from me and my daughters. But he had to make sure that we understood all of that and I think probably to put a little bit of a fear in people is why they want to make sure they tell you that at the end. He did ask me 
if, uh, if I would share my reasons. I gave him a very condensed version of all of this. He said that he would need me to have a written letter for each of us three stating that we wanted our records, our names taken off the records. So I did that and then he passed on all this information to the stake president. He then did get back to me and asked me again if Doug was okay with me taking the girls' names off the records and I said yes. And he said, okay, I need you to write another letter for just them and they need to sign it and Doug needs to sign it as well. When I told my oldest daughter, Abby, that she had to sign it, she said, I'm going to sign it so big that Nelson can read it without his spectacles. That was an extremely proud homeschooling mom moment because she was referencing back to John Hancock and what we'd read about him saying that, that he had signed the Declaration of Independence so big so that King George could see it without his spectacles. So then we gave the form back to the bishop and we waited. He told us that we would receive a letter from the church headquarters when our names had been taken off the records. We did get our letters back saying that they were, we are not Mormons anymore. Doug didn't take his name off the record, so he officially is still on them. At this point, it doesn't really matter to him. For me, it was important. It was an important step to be able to say that I officially am not a Mormon anymore. They cannot use me in their inflated numbers because they say that they have over 16 million members worldwide, but studies have shown that it probably a less than half of that that actually are believing attending members. And I don't want my name counted. Toward the end of 2022, I wrote an email and sent it to all of the apostles that I had found emails for. Some of them came back rejected, only a few of them. And so most of the 12 apostles and the top three received these, this letter from me. In it, I told them that I no longer believed in the church, but that family members and friends that I loved did. And I felt like they owed them an answer to quite a few questions I had. And so I listed those questions. I didn't get an answer. I didn't expect one, but it felt good to send it again for the second time to send a letter to church headquarters. Shortly after we got our letters that we were taken off the church records, I was contacted by the stake president and he asked me to come in and meet him. I was very curious, so I went. And he had the copy of the first letter I had sent over a year before that and the copy of the email that I had sent, along with a letter from someone at the top, I'm not sure who. He didn't read the letter to me or give it to me. Now I wish that I had asked to see it or hear the whole thing, but he basically said that one part in the letter was to tell me I needed to go through the proper channels to get my questions answered. It was improper of me to go straight to the top, but that he should let me know that every member is important to them. No answers to my questions, just a chastisement of me doing it the wrong way. And I guess that was the answer to one question. My first letter when I said, is there room for someone like me in the church? I guess saying that every member is important to the church is answering that question kind of, but no questions to any of the other things. And I said to him, well, if they're saying that I need to come to you and you need to answer my questions, then do you have answers to my questions? And he said, no, I don't. And I have some of the same questions. And that, we ended it. We said, okay. And he was a very, very nice man and I went my way. So that is the truth about why we left. And has it been easy? No, we have been out of the church now for over a year and yet it still isn't easy. I still have people that treat me badly. Like I said, I still have people that are dropping out of my life when I post videos about this kind of thing. My daughters have questions sometimes that they don't know who to trust in churches, that they don't know if when they think of something, if it's actually from the Bible or if it was from LDS theology. And they have to come to me a lot. And we are studying the Bible as a family and in homeschool, we are just learning as much as we can, but we're going to probably always deal with that. And that is why I say bad theology hurts people. It isn't easy just to drop what you believed in and leave. And that is why most people come out of it atheists because they've been hurt and they feel betrayed and they think I believed in this this strongly and it wasn't true then how can God or the Bible be as well it ruins God for people thankfully it didn't for my family I am so grateful that God was the biggest part of our leaving so that we can keep our faith in him and that we have been able to keep our faith in the Bible. One of the helps of that is how much archeological evidence there is when there isn't any for the Book of Mormon. 
because then my daughters have been able to see that and that has been able to help them in the transition. I would say that there is a lot of freedom and such a weight off my shoulders over the last year. We still have not found a church that we are attending regularly. We have gone to a few and there are a few that we like. I feel like we need a really strong foundation in the Bible so that we can discern it easier when we go somewhere if they are teaching us the wrong way. And that probably comes from a little bit of the mistrust of leaders that all of us probably have now. I've been praying all the time that we will find the right church so we can meet with a community of other believers. But as of right now, we do church at home as a family still, and we are making our way through the Bible using a lot of the studies that I have found working from the ground up. Let me know if you have any other questions that I didn't answer or things that I need to clarify again. I would just like to share on here how grateful I am to my friend Ashley for posting the John MacArthur sermon, how grateful I am to pastors all over the world that still are teaching biblical truth, how grateful I am to God that he gave us his word in the Bible and that he has been so patient with me, how grateful I am to Jesus Christ for what he did for us. Whereas little as a few years ago, if somebody had asked me if I was going to heaven, I would have said, I sure hope so. I'm trying my best. And now I can say, Jesus did it all for me. And I know that we are saved. And if you're watching this and you are Mormon and you have questions, feel free to ask me. Feel free to reach out to me. I will help you in any way I can. And just know that there is something greater out there. And don't believe the lies that if you leave this church, there's nowhere else to go. And that if you leave this church, you leave Jesus Christ because they are not one and the same. No matter what you are told, you don't have to go through someone else to get to God. You can go straight to God. You don't have to have a middleman. And to those who are ex-Mormon and watching this, please share your stories with us. And to those of you who are watching this who have never been Mormon, thank you for your interest. I know this has been very long and I really appreciate everybody who has taken the time to watch this.